ABC top five of all time for John Digital Gramophone. Number one, 77, Low. The collaboration with Bowie and Eno, recorded in Berlin. 1964, Crescent. The album that's the precursor to A Love Supreme. Wise One, Drum Thing, Lonnie's Lament. 71, What's Going On, 50th Anniversary, Killer. The album that changed soul forever. 88, Nation of Million to Hold Us Back. Show me what you got. Show us what you got. Takes a nation, a million is a killer. Don't believe the hype, believe the hype. And the final, disintegration. The cure, fascination street. Peace, peace. All right, guys, so uh, we're back. Cracking the top 50, finally with uh, The Stone Roses by The Stone Roses from 1989. So I first heard The Stone Roses in 1994 with their single Love Spreads off their album Second Coming. And I guess, I don't know, they were probably trying to just show all these uh, Britpop whippersnappers like that they weren't really doing anything new. But I, I just happened to take to that album and, and I at that time I gave The Stone Roses a lot more attention than I did Oasis or Blur. And I loved Second Coming so much that I wanted more and this was the only album that there was. And uh, so I picked it up right away. Right from the top, I Wanna Be Adored. It's just an amazing song. Uh, that, that, that slow build with that crackling distortion and then that bass line comes in and then and then obviously those those booming drums and and Ian Brown's vocals are just drenched in like vocal effects um, that sound so sinister and uh, ethereal you know all at the same time and, and, you know at the time like John Squire wasn't really breaking any new ground as a guitarist um, at least not with technical ability Squire's jamming is just in full effect, in particular. Uh, I Am The Resurrection, which is a, a fantastic song. But what made his sound so unique is that he almost, he almost kind of sounded like Johnny Marr playing psychedelic blues rock. But yeah, this album is just an, an all-time classic. Um, I still love it to this day. Next up, 49, I have Homogenic by Bjork from 1997. I mean, I was pretty much into Bjork, at least her solo stuff. Uh, right from the get-go. I mean, uh, human behavior was in heavy rotation on MTV in what, like 92, 93. Of course, Post was the album that I was really in love with uh, for many, many years. There's a lot of uh, experimentation on Post that, that you hear on this record, but, but this album was really the jumping off point where she really moved into experimental art. Of course, she would only get uh, more experimental with her ensuing albums, you know, leading up to today. On this album, it's the the grand, like, orchestral strings woven in with uh, the electronic arrangements that, that really just uh, are a perfect soundscape uh, for her expressive lyrics. And of course, her vocals. I mean, just layers upon layers of vocals. Yeah, I, I think Bjork is not only uh, one of the greatest singers of like my generation, but one of the greatest vocalists of, of all time. And number 48, I have The Pretenders by The Pretenders from 1980. I mean, sure, technically it was released uh, in the US in 79, but I believe there was only like it was like the last week of 79. So it's a 1980 album. Give me a break. So songs like uh, Back in the Chain Gang and Brass in Pocket were, were played on a variety of radio station formats uh, you know, throughout my youth. And then, um, of course, I'll Stand By You was a hit when I was in high school. And it's a song that I never really liked. But uh, the Pretenders were kind of always around. I, I didn't really dive into their full albums um, until like the late 90s. And Chrissy Hind is just the coolest. Um, fuck James Dean. Uh, Chrissy Hind is the epitome of cool. And uh, that is on full display uh, throughout this album. 
you know, she was a scenester, you know, in the in the punk movement. And and sure, you know, the the sound of this record is somewhat punk inspired, but um, you know, it's it owes a lot to the '60s garage rock. And I and I really feel like you know because of that, it's just it's really just a fully fledged fresh sounding rock and roll album. I think the thing that I've always been most impressed with um, Chrissy Hind is just her, her expressive range. I mean, she's, she's always kind of like moving in and out of, of these kind of styles of uh, delivery and her singing, you know, with that uh, gritty punk attitude and then, you know, counterbalanced by that, um, that kind of tender croon, you know, that you hear on songs like uh, Stop Your Sobbing and um, Lovers of Today. Of course, my favorite Pretender song, Kid, is just the one song that kind of encompasses all of those kind of aspects of, of her character. Number 47, I have Television's Marquee Moon from 1977. So my early 20s was when I really kind of devoted a period of music listening to, to really diving into all of the bands that were associated kind of with the, the CBGB scene where so much of, of punk was like this rebellion against uh, jamming and guitar solos, television really embraced it, you know, and, and made it something altogether new, um, presented a uh, guitar-driven rock and roll in a, in a completely new way. The blues is, is pretty much stripped away, and, in, and Tom Verlaine's kind of quirky improvisational style is probably more inspired by jazz. Like not 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 in uh, technical precision or anything, but uh, but at least the spirit of it. And then Richard Lloyd's um, much more fluid, uh, smoother kind of lead style is is just the perfect um, contrast uh, to to Tom Verlaine's, and they they just work so well together. But you know everybody knows about the the guitar interplay. You know as incredible as the guitar interplay is. I was just as in love with Tom Verlaine's vocals and you know his vocal delivery, his cadence. At times, almost an erratic kind of emphasis on specific words within his urban poetry. It's it's his vocal delivery that that's what makes them sound so punk. It's arguably the most influential album on early alternative music, uh, and and especially uh, '90s, early 2000s guitar-driven indie rock. Um, I mean, I, I got into this album right around the same time that I was really diving into the Pixies and Pavement, and I could totally hear the influence on those bands. And number 46, I have Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd from 1975. The classic rock radio stations around the area in which I grew up pretty much played the same three Pink Floyd songs, and, and Wish You Were Here was one of them. Um, for many years, uh, obviously, my parents weren't into this band. They weren't into bands of, of this nature. And so for many years as a, as a youth, uh, it was just those songs on the, on the radio um, and mostly heard in, in my friend's parents' cars uh, that was my only exposure to Pink Floyd. Once I got, you know, a little older and into college and I, and I started to dive into to Pink Floyd's music, you know, through the influence of friends, uh, the, I went the obvious path, you know, uh, Dark Side of the Moon first, uh, and then this one. So why is Wish You Were Here my favorite Pink Floyd album? Um, I don't know. I mean, it just is. <laughs> um, it's probably the uh, the kind of uh, the ode to Sid uh, through throughout certain songs, and and then there's there's just those kind of cool patented like Waters tunes. Uh, Welcome to the Machine and Have a Cigar, which are directly taking on the record industry. This has my, my favorite use of, of synth and uh, my favorite kind of keyboard playing on any of their records. It also has my favorite lead playing by, by Gilmore. I mean, it's, it's just my favorite Pink Floyd album. And sometimes that, that, that's all that needs to be said. All right, this is a quick one for John. Digital Gramophone, counting down his 200 favorite albums the greatest uh this is my greatest album my favorite album i don't know if it is but it's the one that i would reach for if my house was burning down skip spence alexander skip spence or my original pressing on columbia records i got into this album 20 years uh, you know 
20 something years ago, I don't know. It's sort of about the dawn of me figuring out about psychedelia. Skip Spence from Jefferson Airplane, Moby Grape, made this album in 1969. Came out of, uh, what was it, Psychiatric Ward, went to Nashville and just, just went loose. You know, I have multiple different things. This is the end or again. I have different seven inches that are sort of have extra stuff. A ten inch. But it really all comes down to this record. A broken, psychedelic, um, very singular down and out folk thing. One of the most uh, cosmic, mysterious, far out, beautiful songwriting. Um, this record is just have to have to have this record in your collection I think so as I said is it my favorite album of all time yeah maybe it's the one I got like I said if things were burning down I'd come and grab this uh, Skip Spence or 1969 on Columbia Records a truly truly wonderful record and uh, I'm gonna stick with that at number 45 I have XO by Elliot Smith from 1998 so yeah, I got into Elliott Smith because of Goodwill Hunting and his music being used in Goodwill Hunting. Lame, I know. But uh, around that time, I just loved the songs that were used throughout it, and and um, and then Miss Misery was a really cool song, and so I I picked up Either Or, and I really liked Either Or. Um, I think I love it a lot more now, uh, but it was once this album came out that I really. Uh, could call myself like a true fan. So yeah, it's his, it's his major label debut, and you can hear that in the music. Um, of course, you know, obviously, and I don't think the major label debut thing would have ever happened if not for Goodwill Hunting. There's guest appearances from John Bryan and uh, Joey Warrenker on drums. You know, with, with, with guys like that coming into the studio, there's a lot of late 90s uh, LA studio magic happening <laughs> um, in this session. Tom Rothrock was a, a producer that was starting to kind of make a, a name for himself uh, in these years. And his production really only enhanced what was already, you know, a very signature sound that Elliott Smith had already established. There's very Beatlesque uh, production throughout. Uh, there's even Beach Boys influence on a song like Bled White. Uh, but not only, not only on that one, but... Um, the way the, the vocals are layered uh, on certain songs like uh, Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and I, I Didn't Understand. I Didn't Understand is the, the perfect closer, and it just sucks my soul out uh, every time I hear it. You look at him like you've never known him, but I know for a fact that you have. The last time you cried, Inside, thinking that you were about to come over, but I'm tired now of waiting for you. You never show, bottle up and go. If you're gonna hide, it's up to you. I'll come through. Number 44, I have Five Leaves Left by Nick Drake. So yeah, from Elliot Smith uh, into the patron saint of uh, Sad Bastards, uh, Nick Drake. All three of his albums are absolute masterpieces. I love all three of them. I could have gone with any of them uh, for this list. Um, but I'm going with this one by default, honestly, just because it was the first album of his that I ever listened to. My path to discovering Nick Drake is probably a little unique from, from other people. I first heard the song Time Has Told Me in the late 90s, um, covered by Kelly Willis on her album What I Deserve. That album is one of my all-time favorite country albums, and honestly, probably an oversight on my part um, for not including... Uh, Kelly Willis is what I deserve in, in this list of 200 albums. That's what led me to this, and, and Time Has Told Me is still my all-time favorite Nick Drake song. The, the space that exists on this album is breathtaking. 
I mean, I'm sure there's accompanying instrumentation, um, piano here, flute there, a beautiful, beautiful string arrangements. Uh, they sound incredible, but, but none of those things, none of that added instrumentation ever overwhelms or overtakes his, his vocals and his just masterful uh, guitar playing. Yeah, I know. I know everybody that's a fan of Nick Drake th thinks the same thing. I mean, what what could have been, right? At number forty three, I have "Tapestry" by Carol King from nineteen seventy one. Growing up as a kid, aside from like sixties R and B, the music that I probably heard the most um, via my parents were like seventies singer songwriters. Some of the ones that aren't as cool, <laughs> like Jim Croce or Harry Chapin. Um, but then also like James Taylor, who was kind of my dad's favorite. And then uh, this album by, by Carole King, which my mom absolutely loved. Yeah, it's just one of those huge albums in popular music history. Everybody knows how great it is, or at least how well respected it is, if, if it's not your bag. You know, even in my early teens, when I was kind of obsessed with uh, all those bands out of Seattle and uh, alternative rock, uh, I would still cop my mom's cassette of, of Tapestry and and listen to it. I, I loved this album. Uh, I, of course, I'd do that when nobody was around. <laughs> I never would have uh, admitted it to, to, to my peers <laughs> that I loved this album so much back then. And number 42, I have You Got My Mind Messed Up by James Carr from 1967. My introduction to James Carr was all due to Graham Parsons. So yeah, the, the Flying Burrito Brothers covered Dark End of the Street on The Gilded Palace of Sin. But even at the time of first hearing that album, I was probably more familiar with the, the other cover versions of Dark End on the Street and, and, and not James Carr's original recording. It wasn't until I had read the book on The Gilded Palace of Sin that was written for the 33 and a Third series. And Bob Prohl writes about Graham Parsons' absolute love for James Carr. And that was all I needed. That was all I, that was all I needed to read, and I was out in search of James Carr's music. So I bought this CD compilation of James Carr's complete gold wax singles, and it was just amazing. Not a bad song on it. And that is saying a lot because all of those compilations, there's usually at least one that's or two that's not as great, but every single song on that compilation is is great. It's great. I eventually got around to to hearing this album, and I can confidently say that it is without a doubt in my mind one of the greatest R&B soul albums ever recorded from start to finish. There's not a single throwaway track. It is just perfect Memphis soul. As years went on, he just wasn't as talked about as any of his contemporaries. Uh, you know, Dark End of the Street was pretty much his claim to fame. That song at least charted on the Hot 100, um, although not very high. I think maybe somewhere in the 80s, 70s range. I mean, the, the biggest fans of soul music are completely aware of, of James Carr. I, I'm not trying to pretend that I'm like some prophet um, you know, bringing new news of, of this undiscovered artist or anything. But for the uninitiated, I think a lot of people listening to James Carr for the first time would draw a lot of comparisons to Otis Redding. He matches Otis in every bit, in feeling, and vocal range at many times surpassing Otis, in my opinion, especially on this album. In the quieter, more laid back moments, he, he can be just as tender as Otis Redding, but at, oh man, he has more power though, more power. He has this thing where he kind of brings in, for lack of a better comparison, more obvious comparison, um, he brings in, you know, that kind of that kind of raw thing that James Brown has. You can kind of hear a little bit of that at times, especially on the more kind of up-tempo tracks. I am so glad that I discovered James Carr. I'm sure I would have eventually, because of my love of R&B and soul music, I'm sure I eventually would have gotten to him anyway, but I'm glad I discovered him when I did. 
And uh, I mean, he's he's definitely one of my three favorite male soul singers. Uh, we'll we'll get to the other two um, down the line. <laughs> and number forty one, Aereo Plane by John Hartford from nineteen seventy one. So my my friend Mike, um, who is a musician, who is a musician, um, and his interest really is kind of in. Um, flat picking style guitar. Uh, he, he's largely responsible for getting me into a lot of bluegrass. I, I'm pretty sure I talked about it way, way, way back when uh, in this countdown when I, when I talked about Tony Rice. My buddy Mike would just go everywhere with his guitar and he was always good for picking it up and, and playing a tune when, when you're just hanging out and there's just kind of a, a, a dull moment or whatever. And he would play uh, John Hartford tunes. Um, the one I remember the most uh, catching my attention and it, that prompted me to ask him what, wh who's that by was when he played a uh, steam powered area plane off of this album. And Mike absolutely loved John Hartford uh, in a way. I feel like there's just certain characteristics that, that they had um, their I think Mike just kind of saw John Hartford as a, as a kindred spirit. So this album is considered by many to be uh, kind of the first new grass album, you know, kind of a, a fusion of, of bluegrass and uh, traditional folk uh, with more kind of modern uh, singer songwriter style approach. There's a lot of straight up bluegrass tunes on this record, but there's also these kind of quirky folk tunes with his incredibly weird, but also charming uh, wit and sense of humor. If I had to describe the overall feel of the album, I would simply say it's old timey music with a counterculture attitude. I guess I could have just said that and left out all the other stuff before. <laughs> There's just an absolutely incredible cast of players on this record, Norman Blake's on guitar, uh, Tut Taylor on Dobro, um, Randy Scruggs on bass, and, and Vassar Clements on fiddle. I mean, when I first heard this album, it was one of the more unique collections of songs that I had ever heard. And I, it still kind of is to this day. I mean, as familiar as I am with it, I still find it incredibly unique. And it's, it's just all due to John Harper's personality. I've become a big fan of John Harper throughout the years. I have a few of his other records. Um, there's a lot of material out there. Um, but yeah, I just, I just absolutely love John Hartford. I don't see my buddy Mike that much anymore. Uh, he moved up to Massachusetts. And even when he was around this area, Mike was always the kind of guy that was kind of just coming and going. You just never knew when you were gonna see Mike. You know, he would just spontaneously call you up and say, uh, I'm coming to town or I'm already in town. Um, but I just, you know, and, and I wasn't as, I'm not as close to Mike as even a lot of our shared friends. Uh, but he and I just always just kind of had this connection with music and I'll just always forever be grateful to him for introducing me to John Hartford. <laughs> Again. I went in the state and the dang deer didn't come back again. Didn't go very fast on the steam car the real plane. The wheels went around and up and down and inside and then back again. Now sitting in the 747 gypsy watching them clouds roll by. Ain't telling if the sunshine is rain. Rather be sitting in a deck chair high up over Kansas City on a genuine old fashioned old steam car aerial plane.
Digital gramophone. Makes no sense. Mm -hmm.